All right, so we'll get into our next issue related to commercial insurance, workers' compensation insurance. <clears throat> Um, this is an interesting area. It varies dramatically state by state, so I'm, I'm going to give a fairly generic overview of this, this product. I've never worked for a company that sold workers' comp. I have been on the other side in working with companies that are receiving workers' comp insurance. <clears throat> and I also used to do presentations around the country on um, insurance modeling where I would one of the panelists that I always presented with was a workers' comp company representative. <clears throat> so you know that's it's it's an interesting field, very specialized, uh, has uh, quite a dramatic impact on large firms, as, as I found out in my, my my short job in working on this side with USA and its workers' comp. Very interesting field, um, but. It is very unique state by state. Every state has their own rules. Workers' Comp is a product that almost blew up in the early 80s. Most states are having serious problems with Workers' Comp, cost overruns, insurance companies losing money. A lot of it had to do with part of the health care and health care costs rising, and Workers' Comp was taking the brunt of some of those health care costs rising. So uh, a lot of reform happened in the 80s. It hasn't seemed to have been a big issue since then, so it seems like the reforms did did work. But let's give a little bit of history of, of workers' comp. Um, so if you if you're interested in this, this could be a good topic for paper two. Just going in, what what is the current state of workers' comp? Even just a summary. I, I need to do that myself to see if anything major has changed the last couple of years, uh, because it's not a product I see a lot of. But how did it start off in the U.S.? We went from an agricultural uh, environment to a, a very industrial and now service economy. So back during the American Revolution, we were overwhelmingly agriculture. In fact, I was reading a book of the writings of Thomas Jefferson where he says he feared for the United States if we ever came to the point we weren't over overwhelmingly the majority agriculture and farmers he felt that that was that was the heart of the country so he would probably be pretty upset today knowing that we're only about two percent agriculture and that's shrinking farmers are getting older a lot more large corporate farms are developing uh, and there's quite a bit going on in farming that is pretty exciting to reduce the water usage and the pesticide usage uh, so there's a lot going on making farming far more productive and what that means is the US e economy today is very very different at the kind of risk we have when we're working um, what we're we're focused on as far as the injuries that happen to us we'll talk about some of those uh, especially not so much the industrial age but now the information age the type of injuries and kind of concerns we have as workers but definitely the world changed and it's not that <clears throat> The industrial age, the jobs were necessarily more dangerous because there is a lot of risk working on a farm and a lot of injuries working on the farm. It's just that farms were family run and injuries were simply just handled by the family. But now you have employers with a lot of employees. And so it started off in the industrial age where the employee actually had fewer rights than a stranger. So a stranger walks in a business and they get injured, they can sue, they're covered, they, their injuries are compensated. But an employee in that same business gets injured and the company refuses to pay. First of all, the company, the employer could threaten to sue the per or to uh, fire the person if they sue for damages. Secondly, other employees are unlikely to testify for the injured employee because they also feared retaliation and then the law itself protected the employer there was the fellow ser servant rule so all the employer had to do was say hey we weren't negligent it was another employee who was negligent so that's one of their arguments the other one is assumption of risk <clears throat> and what they say here is hey that stranger to walked into our business they didn't know it was dangerous they had no idea they walked in uh, ignorant of the situation and were injured and we were negligent, so we'll pay for that. But an employee, when they sign up, they know this is a dangerous place to work. 
when they sign up, uh, they're they're assuming the risk, and so the employer shouldn't bear any any risk for that. Um, if the employee knows what they were getting into, um, and you look at some of those jobs, uh, there's a great book by um, um, oh, I, forget, um, I, I can't remember the author, but it comes to me in a second. But about the coal mining in um, in the UK, um, and boy, just really really interesting. Um, yeah, George Orwell, excuse me, George Orwell, great, great, great book. If I can f figure out the name of the book, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get you the name of the book. Very interesting. In fact, if you ever get into a job where you just, you hate the job dram dramatically, you really just cannot take this job anymore, then uh, I'll, I'll get you the name of this book. And uh, it's a book you want to read when you hate your job because it explains in detail what it was like actually working in the coal mines. Um, so, but it, it, I, I should have found it before I started this, but um, so dangerous in places and, and places were fairly dangerous at the beginning of the industrial revolution. There was not a lot of concern about worker safety. Plus the machinery was new. It had a lot of bugs to work out of it. So the, the workers were facing a lot of, a lot of a, a unique risk that the world had never seen before. Well, then the environment started changing. Employers, especially look at Teddy Roosevelt and a lot of what happened in the early part of the 20th century. Um, there's a lot more concern about um, workers' safety, about product safety. Um, so it was, you know, a time where the workers' rights and workers' power was gr growing intensely. And so employers started seeing their defenses chipped away and then all of a sudden employers were complaining that the united states was too much of a litigious society workers were suing left and right firms couldn't compete with com companies from around the world and so it, we went from one extreme to the other extreme uh, fairly quickly in the early 20th century and so that was the origin of this work workers comp it's state by state insurance is regulated by the states and we'll talk about that later so the first law was passed in 1911 and then uh, the last state was um, Mississippi it passed its law in uh, 1948 so if you think about um, Teddy Roosevelt <clears throat> He was in office from 1901 to 1909. So this is right after Teddy Roosevelt's um, uh, presidency. So I guess during the Taft administration when the first law was passed. But it did take a while for it to spread through all 50 states. And so this is the compromise. If you think about this compromise, so the regulators are thinking, okay, before the employees had no rights and they were getting injured on the job with no compensation, and now we have employees suing for any minor little thing and employers are being um, essentially burdened with a lot of legal costs, a lot of frivolous lawsuits. What kind of compromise can we have here? And this is what they came up with. This is concept of uh, applying strict liability to work to losses employees suffer, suffer on the job. Strict liability means the employer is at fault if an employee is injured on the job, whether or not they were negligent. So with strict liability, the liability comes from the nature of the activity, not from negligence. So a good example of strict liability would be someone who's doing blasting. So you have someone that's blasting maybe in a, a mine or a, a, I don't know, so just some quarry or some kind, they're doing blasting. It's a very dangerous activity. And maybe some windows are broken on our house because of the blasting. Uh, there's strict liability there. All you have to do is show that the blasting caused the window to break. You don't have to prove that, that the person doing the blasting was actually negligent. Just the simple fact that they were doing something that's considered dangerous. There was a loss that occurred to you. All you got to do is show that your loss was caused by their activity. You don't have to prove that they were negligent. So that's where workers comp is. And where they moved so the employee the employer is 
is essentially at, at, um, liable if the if the loss happened on the job. So they're liable to the employee. And I say, wow, the employer's giving up a lot there. They're essentially admitting that they're going to pay for all claims that come their way, whether they're negligent or, or not. So they have no defense. Well, the employee agrees not to sue the employer and they give up the right to to general damages, pain and suffering. There's there's no punitive damages. Essentially what what we're saying here is um, the states will tell you what you will get based on your, your, your injuries. So the benefits are scheduled rather than awarded by a jury. So if um, you lose a, an appendage, a finger or a toe or um, you hurt your back or whatever, each one of those injuries are scheduled by the state and they tell you exactly what they would pay. They're extremely regulated by the states. Uh, and it's amazing. We'll talk about some of the differences between states and some of the problems that is caused, uh, especially if you have employers in multiple states. It can be be an issue. Um, some of the special issues, and we'll talk about some really special issues here in a little bit, but um, some are expanding uh, the law to state that the employees injured on the job by a product or equipment that the employer created, they do have the right to. Um, to sue under the product liability. So let's say you work for Xerox or Canon and you're using, so you work for Canon and you're using a Canner copier, Canon copier, and you get injured. Well, then you say, okay, I was injured on the job, but I was injured by Canon's product. So some states are saying, well, you can sue either way as product liability or as workers comp. And obviously you look and see which one would pay you, you most. So as we said, in 1980, states were having serious problems, especially because of the health care costs and how health care prices were rising dramatically. And so they had to make some revisions there. Um, all right. In the United States, this is an old statistic, but workers' comp represents 1.6% of employer spending overall. But it it varies dramatically because some some jobs are more dangerous than others. Workers' comp accounted for 4.4 percent of spending in construction. You just know that in construction, uh, anytime you work for a firm that's that's hiring a, um, a contractor, one of the things you check is make sure all of, that the contractor and all the subcontractors have all of their workers' comp in place. The last thing you want is someone injured on the job on your premises building something and they don't have workers' comp coverage. Um, services tend to have smaller workers' comp costs. Uh, we'll talk some about what, what you see in some industries related to corporal tunnel and other things, but uh, certainly the workplace is changing. It's probably safer now than it was in the past, but the, but the injuries are much different. Here's where we are today, workers' comp, and here's the definition that you just want to know. It covers all employees, unless excluded so that you know you know so the you're covered unless you're specifically listed in the list as not covered it's kind of like all risk coverage we saw with homeowners everything's covered except for those things that are listed as excluded so domestic service casual work agriculture employment um, and then there's there's a number of employees restrictions whether it's 10 employees or 50 employees it will vary by state and then here's the real key phrase it's workers' comp <coughs> covers accidents arising out of and in the course of employment. So this is this is key, arising out of. So what does it mean to be arising out of? We'll talk about that. That's become a huge issue. Man, this could be a really interesting paper. Uh, I'm going to Google this while I'm talking to you, but a really interesting paper uh, COVID-19 and workers' comp, I I can't imagine there aren't several articles on that. Yeah, workers' compensation coverage and co coronavirus, COVID-19, that would be an interesting, very interesting paper. And we'll talk about why in just a minute, why that would be so interesting, because it has really changed the workplace overnight. And so firms who had workers' comp coverage, now all their employees are in a different place, doing different type of work, different risk, and it's very, very interesting. It does cover occupational disease, 
Um, so we just talked about that with asbestos. So asbestos could certainly be covered by uh, workers' comp. <clears throat> um, you may be difficult to tell exactly which job the person had, but they got the exposure. But it certainly can be there. But occupational disease, um, there was a famous lawsuit of flight attendants suing uh, over secondhand smoke. And I've always wondered, I, I need to look that up. <clears throat> um, so when the, and um, this is a fairly old case. Um, the, the, the Google searches that are coming up have, you know, state by state by state, whether or not they won this case. But there used to be a time, many of y'all probably have never experienced this, but it used to be a time where people could smoke on flights. At first, uh, people could smoke anywhere they wanted to on a flight. Then they started putting smokers in the back of the plane. But you're in a plane, you're in a tube, having smokers in the back of the plane, you're still being exposed to the smoke. Well, flight attendants who were doing multiple trips were inhaling a lot of secondhand smoke, and some of them were getting lung cancer. Um, and so they were suing. So the question here is whom were they suing? Were they suing the tobacco companies or were they suing under workers' comp? And I think you know, the cases I'm seeing coming up were lawsuits against tobacco companies, but it seems like they could have had a claim under workers' comp because that would be an occupational hazard. <clears throat> um, so that's the thing, things that are covered are rising out of and in the course of employment. There can be some debate about that. We'll talk a little bit about that in our next session. Um, we'll not get to it today. Not covered if someone's intoxicated at the time they're injury, injured. If someone's away from work, then that's kind of interesting. What does away from work mean? We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. Heart attacks on the job, although there are some states that even this Heart attacks could be considered workers' comp if the job is highly stressful. So it's there are some some states that might actually work. If you're on coffee break, so the question there is when did coffee break start? So you're getting up to go on coffee break and you trip over an open file cabinet. Um, are you on the job or are you on your coffee break? So that can be questionable. Um, the question I always had, I had a boss who was constantly calling me on my cell phone. And, you know, I'm always, if I get something on my cell phone, I pull over and park before I take the call. Now we have hands-free, but studies have shown even with hands-free, people talking on cell phones are distracted drivers. So what if your boss has called you and you're talking on your phone and because you're distracted, you have a car accident and you're injured? Would that be workers' comp? And that's why I'm saying the world is changing uh, workers' comp is changing, so that, I think there's some really interesting topics in this area. Um, so that's it, transportation to and from work, but today we have it so you're actually talking to your boss on the cell phone. Uh, I know people who do entire meetings by conferencing in on their phone while they're driving, so you know, are you at work or not at work? So that that's up in question. And in horseplay between employees, you know, that could certainly be a workers' comp. I can think of um, examples from the TV series The Office where he could certainly um, question if something was a workers' comp claim or not. What are the benefits? Well, again, here we have medical insurance over again. We keep seeing medical insurance coming up, whether it's health care, health insurance, or auto insurance, that part part B and C of auto insurance, and now we have it in, in workers' comp. These are coordinated benefits. Um, with other insurance. So usually workers' comp is the primary coverage. So if you're on the job, your other health insurance will not cover you. Workers' comp becomes the primary coverage. There is a moral hazard with workers' comp. There's a lot of people who would rather be home getting workers' comp than being at work. And so it doesn't pay 100% of pay. It pays a percentage of the pay. Uh, we don't want someone um, to prefer to be at home versus at work. Plus, uh, 
a lot of health, a lot of insurance coverages are tax free, and so you've got to at least adjust for the fact that it's take home pay. It does cover medical expenses. Obviously, it covers disability income. Now, disability income comes in many forms. You can have paid time off or sick leave. So you have vacation time, sick leave at USA. When I was there, they combined these two. It's just this paid time off, whether you're sick or on vacation, you could, it didn't matter, you just took your time. And then once you use up all your sick leave, then you fall into the disability. There's short-term disability and long-term disability. And then there's Family Medical Leave Act, which allows you to leave for a much longer period of time without pay, but you can come back and your job would still be there. So there's very different types. Workers' comp is in the as, is in the short-term and long-term disability. Workers' comp comps kicks in after your sick leave kicks kicks in. Um, so it's 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 a disability income. <clears throat> um, you can be temporarily disabled or or totally dis disabled. Uh, there is a waiting period. It's like a deductible, so it doesn't pay immediately. But usually your sick leave covers you during that time. Um, so temporary, but you're totally disabled or you're permanently totally disabled. So if temporary, um, you're expected to come back to work permanent. It could go for the entire rest of your life. I remember when I was at USA looking at our workers' comp files, there were some people who had been on workers' comp for, um, for decades. Um, the biggest issue with USA was carpal tunnel at the time I was there. Carpal tunnel doesn't seem to be an issue today. It seems like we've gotten much better how we use keyboards so we don't overdo it. Plus with the mouse, um, I think the mouse may have cut back on it. But at USA, starting off with computers, people started complaining about carpal tunnel. And I remember senior management at the time just thought, oh, these wimps, what's their problem? They're just complaining. They don't want to work. But then it became so obvious it was a problem because people weren't just in pain. They were truly just completely incapacitated. They could not function. And the workers' comp claims skyrocketed just oh dramatically. Um, it's interesting when I was uh, working in the area where working in workers' comp, I, we were introduced to a gentleman who, an employee at USA, who was just a hand specialist. That was his entire function, it was to help people with carpal tunnel. Uh, that's how big the issue came. We were re redesigning desks and offices and computer keyboards and all this kind of stuff to try to cut down on, on that. So, and carpal tunnel was one of those things that was causing permanent total disability that people just could not function. You might get permanent partial disability. You can go back to work, but you're not 100%. Um, you get paid certain amounts of money for, for certain types of injuries like losses of limbs. There are death benefits, funeral expenses, income for survivors, um, and then rehabilitation benefits. We'll talk s some more about that uh, in, a, in, a, in the next session. I think I'll leave the current issues on workers' comp to our next class um, the next week. All right, so let's just finish up this section and we'll get into special issues. So security arrangements, how do states set this up? Um, so some states, uh, I don't know if it's still six states, this, these numbers change over time, but they have their own state-run monopoly, so that was your only choice. Other states have commercial workers' comp, and then some will have commercial workers' comp, but also have their own state fund that they run. Uh, most states, for large, large employer, employers, allow some type of self-insurance arrangement. You know, you look at a company like GM that has hundreds of thousands of employees, or Walmart, they they can essentially be their own workers' comp company, and so you get some special arrangements with them. All right, so some issues with workers' comp. I want to start next class. I want to start here. I think some of these are very, very interesting. If you're still trying to find a topic for paper two, there is a lot you can do with workers' comp. So just, just the issue of workers' comp and COVID-19. I might look at some of these articles and maybe bring them up next next class, but um, it's really quite interesting concept. 9-11, uh, you could go back and do a workers' comp study of 9-11. Uh, workers' comp was a big part of the 9-11 insurance industry losses. 
So it's, it's an interesting field, it has some very unique characteristics and unique risks that you don't see with any other type of insurance. So there's, there's a lot there that you could really sink, sink into and, and have some interesting research. All right, thanks.